Here we are in the last video of Unit 6, which is Gene Expression and Regulation. This video is going to focus on biotechnology, which is AP Biology Unit 6.8. So biotechnology includes techniques that can be used to analyze and manipulate DNA and RNA. So some of the biotechnology techniques that we're going to be looking at today are electro electrophoresis, PCR, bacterial transformation, DNA sequencing, um, as well as gene editing, including CRISPR-Cas9. So before we get into any of those biotechnology techniques, let's talk about where some of the understanding of them came from. A lot of biotech um, techniques make use of mechanisms that have evolved naturally in bacteria. Um, so for example, what you see in this picture here are um, bacteriophages, which are a type of virus that attacks bacteria, um, actively attacking bacteria. So let's do a little review to make sense of this. What's a virus? A virus is a very, very simple, um, it's not even really an organism because it's not alive, but it's a very simple structure of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat. Um, what you're seeing here is a depiction of a bacteriophage, which is a type of virus that infects bacteria, and you can see it infects bacteria by inserting its genetic material into the host cell. And that's because viruses on their own can't replicate their own DNA, so they need to make use of other cells' um, mechanisms in order to um, get more copies of the virus. How can that bacterial cell defend itself? One way is through the use of restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are endonucleases, which are enzymes that cut up the DNA. So they cut the viral DNA into non-infectious fragments. They just chop it up. And you can see that depicted here. Um, they, the restriction enzymes sort of know not to cut its own DNA because um, the bacteria tags its own DNA uh, with methyl groups in order to protect it. There are a lot of different kinds of restriction enzymes, and you don't need to memorize any of them, but you do need to know how they generally work. Each type of restriction enzyme cuts at a particular sequence of DNA. So if you can see here, ECOR1 uh, cuts in this region of the, if you're looking at the 5 to 3 direction, GAATTC, um, and it cuts in between that G and A. Restriction enzymes create sticky ends on the DNA they cut. What does that mean? Look at the way it cuts. A sticky enzyme means that the ends don't line up. So I said that it cuts between that G and A on the 5 to 3 strand. It also cuts in the G to A on um, the 5 to 3 strand on the other side. So it often looks for sort of palindromic sequences, and then it cuts sort of zigzag. And what that means is there's a chunk of DNA left over, in this case the AATT region, um, that then can be reconnected to another fragment with complementary bases. Because restriction enzymes cut at specific locations, a change to the genome can result in a change to the number of location where restriction enzyme cuts. So because they um, cut really specifically, if the nucleotides change, that can change um, how many cuts a restriction enzyme makes in a particular area. The locations where they cut are known as restriction sites. Um, we don't, we, we often in biotech want to focus on a particular um, region, maybe we're focusing on a particular gene, um, and so we can use what are called probes. We're not going to go into the mechanism of probes, but you can see in the diagram here, it's illustrated with that kind of green squiggly line, and allows scientists to focus on a narrow region of DNA. So how does this restriction enzyme, M MST2 um, restriction sites, differ in these two alleles? So on the top, we have the HBS allele. On the bottom, we have the HBA allele. Um, you might remember these from um, when we were studying sickle cell. On the bottom, the HBA allele um, codes for quote-unquote normal hemoglobin. And then the HBS allele on the top, um, if there are two copies, that codes for sickle cell disease. All right, so let's take a look at these, and we notice that there's a difference in the nucleotide sequence on these two genes. Um, that's what leads to the different protein shape and what leads to sickle cell disease. Um, how many probe-tagged fragments would result for each allele? And um, keeping in mind that those arrows, those black arrows, are the restriction sites um, might be helpful here. 
So the HBS allele, the one on the top, um, cuts on each side of the probed region, which means it's going to be one probed fragment. On the bottom, we see the HBA allele. That has an additional restriction site. So um, that then, because there are three restriction sites, that gets cut into two fragments that are um, in that probed or detectable region. Because these fragments are different lengths, technology that measures the length of fragments can be used to determine which allele an individual has. So we're now going to combine the use of restriction enzymes, which were naturally evolved in bacteria, and we're going to use restriction enzymes and another bio biotechnology tool that is uh, going to allow us to separate these fragments based on their lengths to learn about them. What tool is that? So it's electrophoresis that can determine the length of DNA fragments. How does gel electrophoresis work? The way gel electrophoresis works is you load DNA into the wells at the top of the gel, and then you connect a negative and positive charge to the different sides of the gel. DNA is negatively charged. That's those phosphate groups that have the negative charge. So when there's a negative charge on the side with the DNA, um, that's going to repel the DNA, and the DNA is going to be attracted towards the positive side of the gel. So it's really important that you get the, when you're setting up a gel electrophoresis chamber, that you get the charge correct. So the negative side is on the DNA side, and that's pushing the DNA down. The positive side is on the opposite, and that's kind of pulling the DNA through the gel. Power is turned on, and the DNA fragments migrate through the gel, and they're separated by size. And the way that works is the smallest ones are kind of the most nimble. So they're able to weave through the gel matrix um, most easily, so they move the fastest. So the ones that move the farthest on the gel are the smallest fragments. We can combine these um, understandings, so gel electrophoresis with restriction enzymes, in order to determine what alleles an individual carries. So let's go back to that um, hemoglobin example and look at the HBA and HBS um, alleles and combine this information. So predict the genotypes and the results of a gel electrophoresis that tested four family members where the parents are carriers for sickle cell, the daughter does not have sickle cell, and the son has sickle cell disease. And you can see that in the pedigree up above. And that gray rectangle is going to represent our gel. So if you can imagine the top of the screen, the top of the gray box is where you'll load the DNA in, and then it'll travel um, down through the gel, moving down that gray box. So let's actually start by looking at the daughter and son. So the daughter um, has two copies of the allele um, that is the HBA allele, the quote-unquote normal hemoglobin gene. That was cut into two fragments. So you can see on her gel, so in that third column over, there are two fragments. The son has two copies of the, um, the HBS allele, which means that that's not going to be cut into as many fragments. It's just going to have one fragment. And that's why you can see there's just one band there. The parents, on the other hand, are carriers, which means they have one of each type of allele. So they have one allele that stays as one big fragment and one allele that's cut into two smaller fragments. And that's why in the carriers you'll see three different bands, because it's the combination of two different alleles. So what if they have a third child and they, um, they want to know right away if that third child um, is a sickle cell carrier or has sickle cell disease or does not have the allele? Use the results so they, they do a blood sample on the baby, and they run, um, they run a, a gel using a, a restriction enzymes, and here are the results. So what can you tell from the results on the uh, genotype and the expression, the phenotype, of the child? So based on the results of the gel, we can see that this third child ended up with three bands. And what that indicates is that this child has um, one of each of those alleles, one allele that is um, just stays as one big fragment, and one allele that's cut up into two smaller fragments. And again, those smaller ones are the ones that travel farther through the gel, so they're seen at the bottom. So this individual is going to be a carrier of sickle cell. Another type of biotechnology is called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. 
So medical diagnoses, like the one we just saw with sickle cell, that example, requires many, many copies of the DNA portion of interest. So instead of needing to take lots and lots and lots and lots of cells from that baby we were testing for sickle cell disease, instead we can take a small sample and then amplify it. So PCR is a technique used to amplify or make copies of DNA. What natural process is this similar to? PCR is similar to the natural process of DNA replication. So you can see that it's uh, semi-conservative in the sense that each of those two strands of DNA is separated. In this case, the separation process is not done by helicase. It's done by a temperature denaturization, which separates them. Um, but then each of those is used as a template to create more DNA, to create a new copy. So this can be done enough times. You separate. Um, extend, make a new copy, um, and then separate, attach, make a new copy, until you've got lots and lots and lots of the DNA. So however many, um, however much you need, you just run that many cycles of PCR, and you can get a whole lot of DNA. PCR and restriction enzymes are also used in a process called bacterial transformation, or I should say the biotech form of bacterial transformation. Bacterial transformation is actually, once again, a natural process that scientists have made, uh, taken advantage of. So let's look at sort of the natural process first. Bacteria have chromosomal DNA as well as DNA in the form of plasmids. Plasmids are small circular strands of DNA. Um, plasmid DNA can be expressed in the bacteria and is sometimes incorporated into the chromosomal DNA. Naturally, bacteria are really good at sharing this information from one bacteria to another. This is called um, horizontal transfer, it is the transfer, the transfer of information from uh, one bacterium to another in a non-sexual movement of genetic material. So we're not talking about from parent to offspring, we're talking about from uh, two living bacteria, the information is moving from one to another. So bacterial transformation is one of these types, and it's the type shown on the um, top of this diagram in which the bacteria take in free-floating DNA. Use this diagram to describe how scientists can use bacterial transformation in the lab. Scientists use a restriction enzyme to cut out a gene of interest, in this case from a human cell. So we can see that in the top left, the human cell contains a gene, in this case, uh, human growth hormone, and we're interested in that gene. So we cut that out with a restriction enzyme, in this case, ECOR1, and then that same restriction enzyme is used to open up a bacterial plasmid. That's the blue circle down below. Those matching sticky ends allow for the gene of interest to be joined with that plasmid. So now you have a plasmid of recombinant DNA. So you have the plasmid with the gene for human growth hormone inserted into it. Then you use um, bacterial transformation. You encourage that bacterial cell through some environmental and temperature um, sensitive processes to encourage that bacteria to take in that plasmid. That bacterial cell with that plasmid will now express that gene of interest, in this case the human growth um, hormone. And so that bacteria will be able to produce that protein. Um, bacteria are generally really easy to grow in the lab, and so they can be used to create a whole lot of this um, human growth hormone that can then be um, collected and used for people who don't have enough human growth hormone themselves. Another form of biotechnology is DNA sequencing, and this allows scientists to determine the order of nucleotides of a strand of DNA. This has become so efficient that uh, scientists are able to determine a long, long, long sequence of DNA uh, relatively cheaply and quickly. How might this information be used? Why would we want to know the sequence of DNA? DNA sequence has all sorts of applications. So some of the things you might have mentioned are diagnosing genetic conditions, studying the role of inheritance, um, for example, in susceptibility to disease, uh, studying ancestry and evolution in humans and other species, and the list goes on. Knowing that nucleotide sequence is really important in um, understanding uh, genes and their function. Final biotechnology that we're going to be looking at is gene editing, which is CRISPR-Cas9. So once again, we're taking um, sort of a naturally occurring process and then adapting it into the lab. So what happens is there's a guide molecule that looks for a particular sequence in the DNA. Once it finds it, it cuts that out, 
And then that, that strand of DNA can be replaced with a different strand of DNA, one that's usually slightly different. So um, if there is a single nucleotide that is, um, is causing issues, right, that section of DNA can be cut out and replaced with a section of DNA that has the nucleotide that would produce the functional protein. So this is, um, in, in this diagram, it's showing that this is kind of like the find and replace function. That's the end of the material for this unit, but I do have one more thing I want to add in that might answer a question some of you have had. The question is, why is this cat at the beginning of all of these videos? Why does this cat have anything to do with Unit 6, gene expression, and regulation? So I chose this picture um, because if you remember, the whole point of this overall unit is to figure out how the same genes, like the same cells can have the same genes, but we end up with um, different expression of those genes. So for example, um, all of the, the cells in this cat have the same information. But some of the cells of the cat are expressing um, different, have different functions, right? You can look at their um, cells in the eyes that would be different, cells in its ears that would be different. You could also notice that the pigment cells are different throughout its body. A Siamese cat is actually a really fascinating example of um, a slight mutation compared to what pigment cells in other, um, in other cats have. Um, and it's a pigment cell that then one of the proteins is responds to temperature slightly differently. And so in these cats, the pigment, uh, the enzyme is only going to be active at colder temperatures. So where the cat is hot, the enzyme is not as active. So you can see that the pigment shows up in those colder regions. So that's just a single nucleotide difference, creating a enzyme that has a slightly different activity in terms of when it's active at different temperatures, and you end up with um, a very different looking cat. So that's why this cat is here.